Good morning, good day, and good evening to all our attendees joining us for today's latest Data Science Central webinar. I'd like to start our event off today by thanking Pivotal for sponsoring today's event. This is Pivotal's second educational webinar as part of a series this year in partnership with Data Science Central, also known as the Pivotal Data Labs webinar series. Pivotal is a wonderful partner and supporter of the Data Science Central community, and we are honored to have them sponsoring our event today. I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention and show our appreciation for some of our other recent sponsors, including Splunk, Tableau, Teradata, Actuate, Hortonworks, and Tibco, to name just a few. All of these webinars are available on demand at datasciencecentral.com, and if you have not had a chance to view them, I would encourage you to do so, as they do provide some very useful information. Today's webinar is entitled, Data Science for the 99%, Open Source for Machine Learning and Analytics. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly review the format for today's webinar. Today's event will be approximately one hour long. We have three panelists that I'll introduce to all of you in just a moment. We should have between 10 and 15 minutes for Q&A following the presentation, and this event is being taped and will be made available later on this afternoon at datasciencecentral.com. I would also like to encourage our attendees to provide questions throughout the presentation. We will be reviewing them and presenting them on your behalf at the Q&A portion of today's event. My name is Tim Madison, and I'm one of the co-founders of Data Science Central, and I will be your host for today's webinar. I'm very pleased to introduce today's panelists, Srivatsan, Ramanujan, Wu Jung, and Sarah Arney of Pivotal. Srivatsan is a senior data scientist at Pivotal, where he executes Pivotal Data Labs for customers with a special focus on text analytics. Previously, as a data scientist at Sony Mobile Communications, he led Sony Mobile's data science initiatives that spanned across statistical machine learning and natural language processing. Wu is also a senior data scientist at Pivotal, and he is committed to helping customers make smarter decisions driven by a mix of big data, domain expertise, predictive modeling, and curiosity. Wu has contributed to a wide range of customer engagements at Pivotal, including Pivotal Data Labs in the energy, telco, and retail verticals. And finally, Sarah, who is also a data scientist, a senior data scientist with Pivotal as well, started at Stanford University where she performed interdisciplinary research at the interface of biomedicine and computer science, specifically machine learning. She focused her efforts on building computational models, enabling research for a broad range of fields in biomedicine. Welcome to you all and thank you for being with us this morning. Organizations of all sizes across all industries are using data science to solve problems with new opportunities and achieve actionable results. Empowered by sharing ideas and methods, the data science team at Pivotal leverages and contributes to the community of publicly available and open source technologies as part of their practice. From data exploration and visualization to feature engineering, model building, and scoring, the Pivotal Data Science team uses open source tools exclusively. In today's webinar, our, this team will discuss some of the open source tools in the Pivotal Data Labs arsenal. You will learn more about the variety of these tools, such as Madlib, PLR, PLPython, and Pivotal R, and a host of others that they have utilized and extended for customer engagements. So with this, Sarah, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you, and you can begin as soon as you're ready. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, so as Tim said, I'm a member of the data science team here at Pivotal, and uh, my colleagues Wu and uh, Vatsan and I will be discussing uh, the open source software that we use for machine learning and analytics, um, particularly uh, for performing or creating models um, on customer data and for visualization purposes. Uh, the reason why we feel so strongly about the open source community is that um, it's important for us to be able to draw rapidly from uh, the collaboration in the data science community through open source tools and also contribute back to it. Um, and so to that end, we'll be discussing today how we as a team um, go about the process of selecting the right open source tool um, at the beginning of any um, lab or project that we embark on um, in order to build a predictive model. And we'll specifically be focusing on the different types of approaches that we need to take depending on the challenge that we're met with when dealing with the large uh, data sets that we usually encounter. 
Uh, first, we'll cover how we would go about um, estimating a single large model, so when we're taking all of the data and creating one unified model, uh, versus approaches where it's um, necessary and also appropriate to split it up into multiple models, so taking that large set, chunking it out, and creating separate models. And we'll be ending with the types of visualization tools that um, we often use at the end or throughout the process of looking at the data and models. We thought it would be helpful to start with a bit of a background on Pivotal itself. Um, so we'll, we'll sort of start with the heritage of, of where we come from. So we're the combination of some VMware and EMC um, assets focused around big data. And I, I, we won't be going into too much detail here on all of the different parts, um, but in essence we are focused on building apps, um, storing and analyzing data, um, building models on top of it for either new products for businesses or actually for the business, business itself to rapidly consume and understand large volumes of data. Um, in particular today, we'll be focusing on the bottom part of this wheel that you see on the right, um, specifically around um, how large volumes of data can be stored, accessed, and analyzed, and how our team specifically builds models around these. So to start off, um, I think it makes sense for us to, to give you um, a sense of how that data is actually stored and how we access it in-house in order to build uh, the types of models that we'll be describing. The heritage as far as data storage from, for the data science team at least uh, comes from uh, the Pivotal Green Plum database. And you can really think of it as um, Postgres uh, living across multiple servers. So what that means is you can have a large volume of data stored in a table that's essentially distributed across multiple segments. So anytime you're looking at that enormous data set, instead of just scanning it on a single server, you're actually distributing that work. Um, in particular, uh, Greenplum database has focused heavily around how to optimize queries that are analytics focused. So the types of queries that our team would be interested um, in, in running on that large data set. Um, what's more is that we not only use that environment or that uh, query optimization engine for just looking at the data and understanding it, we also use it to build models directly. So that means that any time we're interested in looking at the data, we scan the table in the database, but also on the fly perform computations to build models. And today we'll be talking about the types of open source tools that we use to do that. Now one extra bit that'll come up is um, Recently, Pivotal has taken that Green Plum database, um, the query optimization, so the actual engine that, that runs smartly, um, massively parallel on top of all of this data, and actually um, sort of replaced the storage which, with HDFS, which means that now you can run um, essentially direct SQL queries on data stored in HDFS. Um, so when you hear Hawk mentioned, um, it is the same concept as that database that we just discussed. Um, running on top of HDFS. So the tools we'll be discussing today um, will be focused around the database and HOP. So going back to the agenda, uh, we'll start off with this concept of how our team goes about actually selecting the right open source tools to build a type of predictive model, taking that paradigm of having the data stored and also a compute happening in the same location. So here's a quick overview slide of the types of tools that we like to use. Um, we, we do often also use commercial tools that are available. So on the left, we're displaying a few of them. Some of them might be familiar, and uh, we might have been using them in grad school, for example, MATLAB. Um, there are others like Tableau that are great for visualization. Um, on the right-hand side, what we're really focusing on are those open source tools or sometimes free tools that we're um, often using in our engagements. Most of the ones that you see displayed here are really focused on how we run analytics or build models without needing to move the data around, and in many cases without having to actually store things in memory. So on the right, we'll be talking specifically about Madlib, R, and Python. Um, later on in the talk, we'll be talking a little bit more about the nuance of what PLR and PLPython, the procedural languages, mean. Um, but we'll really start off with Madlib, which is our own open source um, in-database machine learning library. Um, Madlib is focused on avoiding the need to um, move the data around, but also to do compute in memory. And what that means is by running these analyses directly on the database where it lives, we can take advantage of all of the data that's available in order to build models or analyze um, or understand the data sets. So let's make that a little bit more concrete in terms of what we generally encounter. 
At the beginning of a lab, we'll often be talking about large volumes of data that we're dealing with, um, not just volumes in the number of terabytes or rows in a table, um, but actually in volume and the complexity of what we're met with. So we may have cases where we're met with hundreds of tables with thousands of columns, and we're trying to make sense of what data is important for us to build a model to uh, create something predictive that's of use for a customer. So usually the question that's, that's easiest to ask is how will we build those models and how are we going to score those, score the data that's in there to so actually uh, create an actionable uh, next step for our customer. And we'll be definitely covering that, but there are these other pieces that are often overlooked about how do you quickly get a grasp of all that data, how do you scan um, lots of that data to understand where the variance is or where there might be some amount of signal that you can capture. Um, and even these functions exist in Madlib. So Madlib allows us to quickly scan tables as well to get a sense of the summary of the data that's available to us. In addition to having to actually get a sense for the data in terms of the modeling next steps, what we go through is uh, kind of a mental workflow where we start off deciding what our actual model is that we're wanting to build. Are we looking at a classification problem? Are we looking at a regression? Is it going to be supervised or unsupervised? And generally, we'll decide that we're going to be prototyping it, um, either in R or Python by just uh, running through and understanding what algorithms are most applicable here, or directly in Madlib. Um, so once we want to move on to the next phase of actually building the model on the entire data set that's available to us, uh, the first question we'll ask ourselves is, is that actual algorithm available in Madlib? And the reason why we want to do that is um, we want to minimize the code overhead in terms of being able to move directly into building a type of model on the features that we may have created. So if it's available, uh, we can move directly into using Madlib uh, or Pivotal R or Pi Madlib, which Vatsun and Wu will be covering in just a minute. Um, if it's not available, we'll ask ourselves the question if there's opportunity for explicit parallelization. Um, in this case, we'll be covering specifically what that means, um, and we'll turn to procedural language support like PLR or PL Python. Uh, if not, we'll generally have to treat the database as a more traditional database, access that data, and run um, the actual analyses elsewhere. So those first cases, in particular the one where we want to turn to Madlib, um, is where I'll be focusing in the next few minutes. So Madlib itself um, allows us to create these single large models on data sets that um, can be quite enormous. And the way this works is um, by creating um, models using our own libraries, um, which were developed here and in conjunction with um, Joe Hellerstein at Berkeley. So Madlib itself is an open source tool. Um, it is commercially usable as well. And it supports Postgres, Greenplum, and Hawk. Greenplum and Hawk, which I've covered earlier. Um, and the benefit is because it can handle these large volumes of data, you can really compute and build models off of entire data sets. Um, and we'll talk about just how big those are. The types of functionality that's available is just sampled here on this uh, particular slide that will be coming up in just a second. Uh, we have things um, in the supervised and unsupervised space, so um, k-means clustering, uh, different types of regression. Uh, regularized regressions. We have some descriptive statistics that could be useful in that early stage that we described um, where you're just trying to get handle of your data. Um, and then some uh, support modules um, that are useful as well for um, performing sampling and cross-validation. So let's go through an actual example. Um, here we'll be talking about a use case that our colleague also on the data science team, Rashmi, um, was faced with where she needed to build uh, models on billions of rows of data. Um, so what she was working with was um, data collected from drill sites where their interest was in understanding for a given drill and soil sample. Could they decide how quickly uh, the drill would penetrate into the earth so that you might make, make an optimal decision? Um, so working with billions of rows of data, the ideal thing is to just be able to run something quickly, and a regression made a lot of sense. Um, so in addition to actually quickly going through the data, um, building profiles of which features are um, variables that are available about the drill itself or the site. Um, she was also able to build models on that very rapidly. Um, in fact, she was also able to cluster the different sites, um, again, using the billions of rows of, table, of data directly, um, no need to sample. She did that using Madlib, um, and we'll talk about the actual algorithm um, and how, how this is possible in the database. So in general, your goal with a regression is to try and predict 
some um, variable. So in this case, it'll be the rate of penetration of a drill based on a set of features here, um, which may be some features of the drill or the ground itself. Um, so by trying to identify those linear dependencies between those variables, um, there, there is a, a solution that we've displayed here on how you might compute that uh, using a single scan of the data. So your goal here is to estimate those values C, the coefficients for those different features. Um, and that can be done with this computation. Now, what that requires is for you to scan through all the data, and most of the tools that you're familiar with would actually load all of this data into memory. Now, if you have billions of rows of data, that's no longer possible. So instead, what Madlib allows you to do is if we just take one of those particular computations that needs to occur, so the feature vector um, multiplied by, for every training example, multiplied by the actual rate of penetration, for example. Um, if you're trying to run that particular compute, you can split that job up based on how the data is stored. So now, if you're splitting that data billions of rows across this distributed database, what that allows you to do is access, in parallel, many of those different training examples. What's more is, as you're scanning the table, you can actually do this compute on the fly. There's no reason to just serve up that data and then do the compute. Uh, these nodes are capable of computing on the fly as well. So in fact, this is exactly what Madlib does um, in the case of linear regression, is as you're scanning the table, it performs the necessary computations. What this means is that you can actually use all of the data that's available, but you can also do it extremely quickly. So here we're looking at one example um, publication uh, that you can access there at the bottom uh, with the citation, where uh, it's looking at tens of millions of rows, and with 24 segments, you can actually compute um, a regression for over 300 features in under a minute. So this allows you to really understand why Madlib is so um, valuable in terms of being able to use or leverage all of your data, um, not just for speed, but also just the, the actual ability to do this um, very simply. So to give you a sense of how simple that is, let's just really quickly look at an example of how that would be run in the database. So in this next example, let's imagine that our goal is actually to predict the price of a home based on some input features. Um, so here on the right in that, um, in that box, we're looking at a particular function, the linear regression training function, and you have some input table houses that contain a set of features, um, so maybe tax information about the home, uh, number of bathrooms and the square footage, and you're hoping to predict the price. So using a, uh, a table that is stored actually in the database, it can be extremely large and distributed, you can just simply call this particular function and it will save the results in a table um, house underscore, houses underscore linear regression. Not only are you able to run one massive uh, regression in this way, let's say that you actually want to create many separated um, uh, models for a different number of bedrooms, for example. Um, that's possible as well by just creating um, a new sort of call here where you're grouping it by the number of bedrooms. Scoring it is actually just as easy. Um, the data is never moved off of those nodes again. So once you have this model and it's stored in that database, you can actually run a scoring on some other table or the same one if you want to sort of check how well you did um, just by running our Madlib linear regression predict function. Um, so again, you just reference a table, send in uh, the name of another table that's of interest, and um, describe the feature columns. Now this is extremely fast and efficient, as you saw before, and a pretty simple interface for anyone familiar with SQL. Um, but in the case where you might have a user that's not so familiar with using SQL, um, Woo will actually cover some other options that we have created here, more open source tools to access our open source Madlib library. <clears throat> Thanks, Sarah. Um, <clears throat> so as Sarah mentioned, uh, I'll walk you through sort of uh, the R wrapper to uh, SQL and Madlib um, today with you. And just to get things started, um, I'm going to start with uh, the code that Sarah just showed you earlier about building a regression model um, in Madlib where houses is a dependent variable and you have some explanatory variables that you're that's my coefficients for. So that's the SQL code on the right. But what we want to do with Pivotal R is actually we found that a lot of data scientists don't necessarily, um, you know, aren't necessarily SQL experts. And so we kind of wanted to bring sort of the power and benefits of in database analytics to, to data scientists who are very fluent in R, but may not know too much SQL. 
So really the, the simple solution here was to uh, translate our code into SQL. Sorry, there's some lag with the animations here. So to translate our code into SQL. And so what we did was PivotalR is an open source uh, R library that's available on CRAN. And basically that SQL code that you see on the right then gets translated into the C or sorry, the R code that you will see in one second on the left. Um, and so basically, uh, that's sort of what PivotalR allows you to do. The user would enter in a uh, code that you see on the left, mavdub.lm, and in the back end, and in the back end, the, the R code is then translated into SQL that's shown on the right. <coughs> uh, one actually key design decision with Pivotal R was that uh, we wanted to keep the uh, user experience as R-like as possible. And so um, as you can see, even with the code on the left, the madlib.lm function, which is the uh, Pivotal R function for linear regression, is, uh, is actually identical and mimics very, very closely the native R function for linear regression now. And I kind of want to just quickly uh, take you through uh, an overview of the design of Pivotal R. Um, and so what you see on the left here is, uh, let's say, your laptop machine that has R installed on it. And none of your data actually is, is stored here or is living there. And on the right, you have <coughs> your, your database or Hadoop instance with Hadoop, excuse me, with Mavid installed. And um, <coughs> the uh, kind of tunnel between the database and uh, the laptop is uh, either like an ODBC connection or some kind of DBI connection like our PostgreSQL. And that's another package that's available as an open, uh, open source resource in, in CRAN. And so basically, and so basically uh, the user would install this library, PivotalR, on, on his or her laptop and uh, write some R code, which then gets translated into SQL. Then the SQL code um, is then passed through this ODBC pipe, um, and really it's just strings of text that are getting passed through to the database. And then what happens is that the SQL code is then actually executed directly inside of uh, uh, PostgreSQL, uh, Greenplum, or Hadoop. And so all the heavy lifting of model estimation is actually happening inside of the database in an out-of-memory environment. Then what happens is, okay, so you run your model, but <clears throat> you know, what do you want to get out of it? You actually want to get out, let's say, the summary statistics. So in the case of regressions, it would be things like coefficients, standard errors, et cetera. And that you know, very, very small amount of data is then pushed back through uh, this R post SQL pipe. So really, it's, uh, it's, it's all about kind of optimizing uh, kind of the, the ease of use of, of these uh, in-database tools um, with the performance that in-database analytics brings in the back end. And I'll kind of just walk you through the current features uh, that are available today in Pivotal R. I will say that it's a, it's a very active and uh, ongoing project that's uh, being led by Hai Chen, who is a uh, senior software developer here at Pivotal. Um, the current MATLAB wrapper functions that <clears throat> are available are linear regression, logistic regression, summary functions, uh, ARIMA, and Elastic Net. Um, some related functions that are helpful in the model building process, which are currently available in Pivotal R, include uh, cross-validation, uh, bootstrap aggregation, uh, marginal effects, predict summary, etc. We also have, uh, like I mentioned, a, a key focus is on, is, on, is on preserving the R look and feel of this library, right? So there's rich support for R's formula syntax. Uh, so you'll have everything from uh, row column indexing to uh, as factor support. And uh, in addition to sort of wrappers for uh, modeling algorithms, we also have uh, R wrappers for traditional uh, SQL queries, including joins and uh, group buys. Uh, and so this merge and buy function, which are available in Pivotal R, again, are identical in look and feel to the merge and buy functions that are natively available in R. In addition to that, we have broad support for key R convenience operators, as you see um, on the bullet points below. So I walked you through a R wrapper of SQL and Madlib, but um, my colleague Watson will walk you now through uh, a Python wrapper um, that's available in Python. Thank you, Wu. 
So just as with our wrapper for Madlib, we also have a Python wrapper for Madlib called PyMadlib. And if you think about, you know, what, why do we really need these R and Python interfaces to Madlib? Well, Madlib is a godsend in terms of the computational power it gives you. It helps you build models on, you know, tens of hundreds of millions of rows of data and sometimes even billion rows of data. It's open source. It's extremely powerful and scalable as we shown in some of the examples uh, where we've executed use cases for our customers. It's got a growing algorithm breadth. They are on a monthly release schedule. But it's all SQL, and it will be hard for us to ask all data scientists to use SQL, especially the folks who come from the R and the Python side of the world. On the other hand, Python is open source. It's, although memory limited, it's got an extremely large collection of libraries, uh, and it's got a wide algorithm breadth. So who wouldn't love using you know, their favorite libraries like Pandas, Scikit-learn, NumPy, SkyPy, and all the visualization libraries in Python like Matplotlib, MPLD3, and all the things that the beautiful folks at Continuum have been building like Bokeh, um, you know, and all those visualization libraries. So our answer to this is to provide the flexibility of the language like Python with the computational power that Madlib offers in this package called as PyMadlib. The current list of algorithms supported in PyMadlib are the most frequently used algorithms in most of our customer engagements. These include linear regression, logistics, k-means, and LDA, which is a topic modeling toolkit. In addition to what is offered by Madlib purely in terms of wrappers in PyMadlib, we also have support for categorical variables. So when you build models in Madlib wherein you want to combine a set of you know, real-valued columns with a set of columns which have categorical values, you typically have to do some sort of a transformation or pivoting before you can invoke some of the algorithms in Madlib. But PyMadlib allows this to happen behind the scenes without you having to manually do that transformation. So these are some of the extens you know, extensions of Madlib which we've implemented in PyMadlib. Moving on, so here is a quick example of you know, how you would go about using PyMadlib. Again, I would encourage you to visit our GitHub page called Go Pivotal on GitHub. Under that, in the project PyMadlib, you'll find a lot of examples, you know, including installation, building, and how do you go about invoking some of the PyMadlib wrappers. We also have an IPython notebook for you, IPython notebook fans, to, you know, try it out live. Um, you can do that as well. So in this example, I'm building first a linear regression model and secondly a logistic regression model. So the data set I'm using is a UCI wine quality data set. So I'm interested in predicting the quality of wine based on parameters like the alcoholic content, proline, the hue, color intensity, so on and so forth. And it's as simple as you know, initiating a linear regression model by passing in a connection to the database. And once I've initialized the linear regression model, I simply invoke train on this model by telling it what is the table in which my features reside. I tell it what are my independent variables, and I tell it what is my dependent variable. And likewise, once the model has been trained, I call predict on this model by passing in a test set, and I tell it what is the target variable of interest. Once I get the prediction results, I can quickly plot a scatter plot of the predicted versus actual value to see how good my results are. Again, for the user, everything is being done in Python, but internally, PyMadlib is speaking to Madlib, which is resident on your backend database, which could be Postgres or Greenplum database or Hawk, and it does all the heavy number crunching over there, and the results are then sent back to you so that you can visualize it in whatever favorite toolkit of choice you have. In the second example, I'm building a logistic regression model. And again, here I'm just predicting the quality as good or bad based on the same set of features. And the interface is fairly similar. You simply initialize a logistic regression model. You train it. You tell it what is the table which contains the features for the training data. And then you do a prediction. And in this case, you are interested in predicting the ROC curve to see how well your model performs. And again, you know, there are a whole lot of libraries in, in Python which can do a lot of model visualization, and it's good to have an ROC visualization available as well, and PyMadlib helps you achieve this in fairly, you know, a couple of lines of code. 
Some of the things which are upcoming in PyMatlib is data frame support. I mean, everybody loves pandas and pandas data frames. So we are going to bring that in shortly as well. And with that, with all the breadth of algorithms available in MATLAB, I think we'll have you know a very strong stack of uh, you know data science tools where you have both the power and scalability of MATLAB with the flexibility and ease of use of Python. With that, I hand it off back to Wu to talk you through some of the ways in which we build multiple models which are kept in memory but on large data sets by piggybacking on the MPP nature of some of the backend platforms we have. Thanks, Watson. So as, as, as Watson mentioned, uh, I'm going to start to walk you through uh, a set of problems in which uh, the algorithm of choice, let's say, is not available in Madlib, um, but there are opportunities for assisted parallelization. And in these situations, we can leverage the rich procedural language uh, support that's available on a platform like Pivotal. Uh, specifically, I'll walk you through uh, procedural language R or PLR. And so before I do that, I kind of just wanted to uh, level set a little bit and just talk a little bit about what data parallelism or explicit parallelism is. And so what basically this is uh, a way for you to, you know, uh, break up uh, your data set into um, smaller pieces and estimate a model or run some processes on each chunk of that uh, data set. And so some examples here are, you know, uh, having each person in this room, you know, weigh themselves. And so you're measuring each person's weight in parallel in this case. And there are a bunch of others. Uh, in sort of the programming uh, world, there's, you know, the map function in Python, the apply family of functions in R, of course, and of course the MapReduce framework um, on Hadoop. And so really just to kind of make things crystal clear, let's say you have a deck of cards. Um, rather than uh, counting them, uh, having one person count, all of the cards uh, by, by herself. This person can then distribute this card to, let's say, seven people, and each, uh, each, each person would then count his or her smaller deck of cards. And by doing this, you're then counting cards in, in parallel. So with that, I'll also just uh, quickly give you an overview of what user-defined functions are. So uh, traditionally, maybe when people think about SQL, they just think about select statements and whatnot. But actually, in SQL, there is actually a rich framework uh, for building your own uh, kind of programmatic uh, functions, and uh, we call them UDFs um, in the SQL world. So on the left here, you have some code that's defining some uh, some function. Um, in this case, it's just multiplying two to some number. And on the right, and on the right, you also have uh, what's returned when once you invoke this function in SQL. And not only are we able to write uh, user-defined functions in the SQL language on Pivotal, but we're actually able to write them in a variety of languages. Um, and so we call this uh, general type of support, PLS support. And so uh, we have uh, a variety of languages, as I was mentioning. So this includes PLR, PL Python, PLC, PL Java, et cetera. And basically, um, let's say in the case of PLR, R is installed in every single segment of Greenplum and a specific chunk of the data is then sent to that R environment on a single segment of Greenplum and, and executed um, in parallel across all the different nodes. And this is great because um, it allows these PLS languages to uh, piggyback on Pivotal Greenplum's uh, sort of native MPP architecture. So I'll walk you through a quick example uh, of this uh, using PLR. And uh, let's say you have some, uh, you know, Pivotal Greenplum instance installed, and you've also installed uh, PLR. And uh, what that means is that R is sitting then on every single node of, of Greenplum. And let's say what you want to do is actually build a regression model, but build a regression model for every single state in the United States. And let's say that we've distributed our data so that um, you know, the data for every single state or for each state is sitting on a single segment of Greenplum. What you can do then is actually build a really, really simple PLR function to uh, estimate the, uh, the model for each state on every single segment of Greenplum co-located uh, with the data for each state on each segment. And then I'll kind of uh, provide you with some more. Sorry about that. <laughs> kind of provide you with some more details on the actual code itself to get this done. 
on Pivotal. And so uh, what you want to do is actually, with placeholders in SQL, you can write functions in the native R language. So uh, this code that I'm about to show you right now is a standard uh, linear regression code um, that is familiar for our users using the lm command in R. And what I'm doing here is just returning the coefficients after running this regression model. And then what you do is actually you create placeholders in SQL by creating a SQL type. And what this is, it's basically just, a, you can think of this as a skeleton table with uh, columns predefined. In this case, um, I want, I'm kind of pre-thinking this and, and kind of expecting what I would return from this uh, R function or R code that you see above uh, the create type statement. And so uh, in the context of estimating a linear regression model, after you estimate uh, the coefficients, you basically just want to get them back and also want to get back some summary statistics that are associated with them. And so I've created a skeleton table here with the variable name, the coefficient estimate, standard error, t-statistics, and p-values. And then what you do is actually just create your PLR function uh, by specifying the arguments of the function or the inputs to the function. And then you just really, literally just drop that R code into the body of this function definition. And so, like I said, it's actually very familiar for our users, and it's a pretty straightforward and powerful modeling framework. Now, once you've defined this function, what you want to do is actually start to use it, right? So, uh, you can execute your PLR function by, you know, using code like I've shown here. And uh, basically, uh, that LM function that's getting called is the one that we just created in the previous slide. So then you execute the function, and what you get back is actually a, a plain and simple um, SQL table that contains uh, your variable names, coefficient estimates, standard errors, t-stats, p-values, et cetera. Now, I've walked you through a, a relatively simple example, and we've been using linear regression here throughout our presentation because it's something that's familiar to most data scientists. But uh, this PLR framework actually uh, allows you to do things that are very, very complicated. And actually, um, with sort of the right programming strategy, you're, at, you're able to get things done which are very, very sophisticated uh, from a statistical uh, point of view. So I'll walk you through a couple of examples of that in my next slides. So suppose you wanted to uh, build a decision tree, but you wanted to do some bootstrap aggregation on, on multiple decision trees. Uh, so in the context of PLR, what this means is you can create um, kind of separate individual bootstrap samples of original data and store them, at, store them on every single segment of Greenplum, right? And then what you do is run something like R part on every single segment of Greenplum. And in the context of classification, let's say we want to predict whether something is green or red, each of these separate segments has its own kind of vote or, or prediction of what the outcome will be. Then what you do is you take all of those votes and you basically just take the majority. And so in this case, more of the segments said that a particular record should be a green prediction. And so your final uh, aggregated prediction is green. And by doing this, you're actually, uh, you've just implemented a parallel bad decision tree on a platform like Pivotal. My next example uh, is around Bayesian inference and particularly around uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo and how you know, one could possibly do this on a platform like Pivotal. And so uh, to go back to the example that we were discussing earlier about the uh, regressions by state, let's say rather than building an entirely separate regression model for every single state, you wanted to build one big regression model, but you wanted the intercept terms to vary and also uh, apply some shrinkage to it so that maybe all the intercept terms in this regression share a common prior, maybe the intercept term for the entire U.S. And to get this done, this is basically, uh, you know, your classic vanilla multi-level hierarchical model. And traditionally, people have done this on, on uh, you know, kind of can give samplers, such as JAGs um, or BUGS, um, or most recently, like STAN, uh, through R wrappers like RJAGs. Uh, but what we're, what we're going to show is actually uh, you can do this in PLR on Pivotal by running parallel multiple MC, MCMC chains with M iterations per chain, each on every single segment of Greenplum. And so if you have, let's say, 100 segments on Greenplum, you can run 100 MCMC chains in parallel.
So my next slide here actually shows you some buzz code that will be familiar for the Asians in the audience. Um, but basically, this is uh, exactly the same kind of bug code that you'd write for something like JAGS. And then you store this as a text file and, and push it to every single segment on Greenplum. And then what you do is you create a PLR function that references this model.bug file, which is sitting on every single segment of Greenplum. And that bug file is circled in green here. And then basically, you execute this function on all Greenplum segments. By doing that, what you end up with is actually a MCMC -MC chain that's running on every single segment of Greenplum in parallel. And uh, let's say if you have, uh, in this example, six segments of Greenplum, you're running six chains of MCMC. -MC. Maybe let's say they have 10,000 iterations each, and they're all running independently. And at the end of the 10,000 iterations for every single segment, can then aggregate them. So you have now, rather than 10,000 iterations, 60,000 iterations from which to get better and more accurate posterior uh, probability intervals. So I've walked you through uh, sort of some examples of how to use PLR, but, uh, but Watson will actually now walk you through uh, some examples of how to use PL Python on Pivotal. Thanks again, Wu. So just as Wu showed you how we can build multiple models simultaneously by making use of the MPP nature of the backend platform using PLR, you can do a lot of cool things similarly using PL Python. And PL Python is just a procedural extension of Python. So pretty much any library which works with Python, you can install it on all segments on your backend platform and then use PL Python to build your models uh, for data parallel tasks. So in this example, I'm going to show you how do you build multiple models in parallel for a toy problem. So the data set I'm using here is a UCI machine learning repositories auto MPG data set. So for those who are not familiar with this data set, it's a collection of several automobiles um, you know, for which there were parameters like their engine type, the kind of fuel injection system, the kind of body type the cars have, and a lot of engine parameters like the bore compression ratio, the number of cylinders it's got, the number of doors the car has, so on and so forth. And the task is to predict the miles per, ca miles per gallon of these cars. So if you think of, you know, how do you go about building a model? So one way to approach this problem is to build one single model for all automobiles. Or you could think of a scenario wherein you want to ignore aerodynamics aside. So in other words, you want to build a model for each body type. So you know that you know, hatchbacks have a different aerodynamics compared to SUVs, you know, compared to you know, a sedan, for instance. So if you want to build one regression model to predict the miles per gallon for each car, for each body type of the car, then you know, PL Python is an excellent choice for a problem like this. So the reason why it works really well is because when your data is distributed across multiple segments based on the body type of the car, each segment can build a linear regression model in parallel without having to depend on the other segments which are building models themselves. So in the next slide, you'll see how we go about doing this using Scikit-Learn in PL Python. Again, you know, Scikit-Learn is a very favorite library for a lot of data scientists in, in our team here at Pivotal, but it's also used you know, by the larger community of data scientists. And I'm going to use the ridge regression model in Scikit Learn. And here's how you go about doing it. So first off, you define a user-defined type, which you know, is purely meant to store the model results. So when you build a linear regression model, you get a bunch of coefficients for each feature. Then you get an intercept term. And then you can also measure how well your model did on the training set by returning the R square for the model. Secondly, I define a user-defined aggregate function. So the reason I need this aggregate function is because I'm going to take in all the features for this task and stream it in as a large float array into a user-defined function within which I'll be building the regression model itself. So the user-defined aggregate basically invokes what is called as a state transition function. 
So a state transition function, you could think of it as a function which contains an internal state, and every time you supply it a new row, it updates this internal state. So in this case, the state transition function is simply an array concatenation function. So when you pass it in a row which contains a float array, it will update its internal state, which is also a float array, by appending the new row of float arrays that you supplied it with. So that is all the user-defined aggregate is doing. The core of the linear regression model itself is inside the user-defined function that you see on the bottom of the screen. So first off, the section highlighted in orange is the SQL wrapper. The SQL wrapper basically says, how do I convert Postgres types or green plum data types into internal Python types? And it, it is basically the function signature. So in this case, you know, I tell it that I'm passing in a feature matrix, which is in a linear form. It is not in a matrix form. It's one large linear array. It contains floating point values. And then I'm telling it the number of features. Now, I tell it the number of features so that I can, you know, reconstruct this linear array into a matrix, which I can then use to build the linear regression model. And finally, I pass in what is called as the target variables of interest. So inside the PL Python function, you can see that I'm importing linear model from scikit-learn. And then I'm reshaping this large linear array of features and converting it into a matrix. And that matrix I'm passing into the ridge regression model of scikit-learn. And then I'm finally simply you know, returning the model coefficients, the intercept, and the R squared. In the next slide, you'll see actually how this is being invoked in practice. So you can see that in the inner select query, I'm selecting body style because I'm going to distribute I'm going to build one model for each body style, and the features of interest are the bore, stroke, compression ratio, horsepower, and peak RPM of the vehicle. Once I've constructed my features for each body style, in the outer query, you can see that I'm aggregating these features using the user-defined aggregate so that I have a large linear array, which is my matrix of features. And then in the outermost loop, you can see that I can invoke the user-defined function which I just wrote to build one model per body type. And the results of this is displayed in the bottom of the screen. So you can see that I've built two models essentially in parallel. One is for hatchback and the other is for sedan. And the host name column tells me that on which physical machine was the model built. So the first one was built on SDW6, which is a different host from the second model, which was built on SDW7, so you know we have this parallelization taken care of without having to do much. And then you can see the coefficients of the model. So pretty much it says that you know every parameter, engine parameter, contributes negatively to the miles per gallon of the car, except for the stroke of the vehicle. And the models are reasonably good with R square of 0.73, even for a toy problem. So that is you know, one cool way of utilizing all the vast library of algorithms in PL Python. Moving on, we wanted to also quickly walk you through some of the open source visualization tools that we use extensively in many of our customer engagements. The first of these is uh, you know, Pandas is you know, any Python, ask any Python developer or data scientist and they will tell you how, how much they love Pandas. But Pandas you know, requires a lot of hard coding for your custom tasks. So we wanted to abstract away the complexity of pandas and give data scientists a tool wherein they can just simply write a query and the returned columns are then you know, passed on to pandas to quickly visualize very commonly used you know, plots like scatter plots, time series plots, scatter matrix, density plots, box plots, so on and so forth. And we wrote an open source tool called Pandas via PSQL. Again, if you go to our GitHub page following the link on the slide, you should be able to access you know, the implementation details. But very simply, we all use some sort of a SQL engine to query a backend database to pull out columns of interest. We thought it would be really cool if we can pipe in the extracted columns on your terminal into this tool and use Pandas to quickly visualize those results. So Pandas via PSQL will work with any SQL client. It is backend agnostic, so you could use it even on MySQL or any other database of your choice. You just have to install this tool and have Pandas installed as well. So we've used it for many of our customer engagements wherein we wanted to show quick plots of our data to get a handle of it. So 
So as you can see from the example, I'm simply selecting a bunch of columns, piping that result into this tool, and then voila, I get scatter plots, I get density plots, hex bin plots, so on and so forth. So it's one cool tool to get a you know, quick feel for your data. Also, a lot of us have heard of d3.js. You know, it's a really cool library of JavaScript visualizations. And we've used visualizations from d3.js in building a lot of our internal demos. And this is one such example. So, you know, we built a topic and sentiment analysis pipeline using a lot of our, the tools that we spoke of, like PL, Python, Madlib, so on and so forth. We got data from GNIP, and we then, you know, computed, uh, we stored this data first on a big data stack, and then we computed some interesting models on this data, namely the topic model and also a sentiment analysis model. But to be able to visualize the results of these models and you know, make a compelling uh, use case for customers, we built demos using d3.js plots. And these d3.js plots were running on, visualizations were running on web servers again in, in the PyData stack, which includes Django, Nginx, and Green Unicorn. I would encourage you again to follow the video link on this slide on Vimeo. We gave a talk about this, this visualization um, uh, demos that we built on d3.js. It's available on Vimeo. You can go and see how we've used d3.js extensively to showcase uh, some of the tools, uh, so, some of the backend algorithms which are in our stack. Again, another quick example, we also built a transport prediction pipeline so to identify how traffic disruptions could you know, delay your commute. So this is from our colleague Ian Houston, who's based in our London office. And this is available, uh, you know, publicly. So if you go to the link on the slide, DS demo at uh, CF Apps. So this is all running on Cloud Foundry. And the way it works is it pulls in data from, uh, you know, a publicly available API, which contains information about where traffic dis disruptions have happened in the city of London. And then using tools from the PyData stack through PL Python, we've built models to predict how much a particular traffic disruption is likely to delay your commute or how long it's going to take, take to get it fixed. And, and those results were visualized using D3, again, through Python uh, libraries like Vincent and Vega. And again, I encourage you to follow this link on the slide where you'll get more details about how we use these open source visualization tools in conjunction with Madlib, PL Python, PLR to build end-to-end -end demos. And um, you know, hopefully that should give you a quick idea of how you could also use these toolkits. So okay, finally, what's in it for me? Well, we've got a whole lot of resources listed over here, which should help you get started in your own big data analysis as well. So first off, Madlib, again, is open source, try Madlib, Civital R. We've also got some parts of speech taggers which can be run in SQL, which is essentially a wrapper over you know, one of the state-of-the-art parts of speech tagging toolkits for Twitter. We also have a references guide for PLR. Uh, you can get all copious amounts of examples, working um, you know, explanations of how PLR and Pivotal R work. Likewise, Ian Houston, one of our colleagues, also has a guide for PL Python likewise. And all of these are available on our GitHub page. You could follow these links. So Pivotal is open source, has Pivotal has open source in our genes. In addition to a lot of open source projects like the ones you see listed above, we've also contributed a lot to Python and R libraries, be it on CRAN or on PyPy. With that, I think um, we are done with our presentation. I guess we are now open to questions. Great presentation, you guys. Really amazing detail. Uh, we are running a little short on time, so I want to make sure that everybody that's in attendance uh, views the current screen that has uh, the presenter's information so you can contact them directly. So I'm going to try to squeeze in a few questions here before we run out of time. Uh, the first question is, can you provide more details on parallelization in R with some relevant examples? Sure. Um, I would say the best resource for this would be to follow our PLR and Pivotal R guide on GitHub. We've got a whole lot of examples there where we show how you can parallelize a given task and also verify parallelization works using three different approaches. So I strongly encourage everyone attending this talk to go to our GitHub page and read our PLR guide. It's got copious amount of examples which will answer your question. Okay, great. 
Uh, next question is, which code will execute faster, the SQL query or the R script? Um, you know, it's, it's probably uh, similar in, in, from a performance standpoint. Um, it's basically just the extra time that it would take in Pivotal or just the amount of time that it takes to send a string of text across an ODBC type, which is very, 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 very short. Okay. Sounds good. Good quick answer. Uh, next question: Is it fair to say that the data presented is unstructured? I'm sorry, is structured data? So the the data that's going into the models that we presented is structured. So it's been taken usually from some for tabular format, ingested. Um, you can definitely work with unstructured data that you uh, derive features from, and we didn't go through those steps of feature engineering, which of course in any in any modeling exercise, that's generally the most difficult task, is to get all of your features and transform them into something meaningful. Um, we focus a lot on our technology and using the database or Hawk because you can create those features very rapidly um, in this distributed framework. Um, but yeah, everything that you saw was essentially structured. To add to Sarah's point in, in our topic and sentiment analysis pipeline that we described in one of the slides, the data was unstructured text we got out of Twitter, but then we built topic analysis models on top of this and also sentiment analysis models wherein we took unstructured te text and then derived structured features out of them. Very good. Okay, the next question is, how would you compare Madlib with R? Sure, so Madlib, you know, if you follow the flowchart that data scientists in Twitter use about how do you go about choosing which tool to use, we would use Madlib definitely when the algorithm of choice is available in Madlib, and especially when the data is several millions or tens of millions or even billion rows of data. Because R runs completely in memory, it doesn't really scale well to large data sets. So if the algorithm of choice is available, we will definitely go with Madlib. But having said that, you know, R has a vast library of you know, open source contributions. You know, there are 4,000 plus packages on CRAN, so if you are in a situation where you need a really specific algorithm which is only probably available in R or some Python library, we would strongly encourage that you use that. But then you will have to live with the limitation of you know, what you can store in memory. I think also one of the benefits to mention about, and also why we feel so strongly about open source software in general with Madlib is um, when there is something that is just sort of one step away from what's available in Madlib, um, there are ways to go in and of course change it, create a new module or a new method, um, we've altered them, for example, from a regular least squares to weighted least squares um, by going into the source code. Just okay. add to that. Very good. Um, next question is, it seems like Madlib is more powerful than procedural languages. Why would I use it? Or why wouldn't I use it? Or always use it, I'm sorry. So I think it's going back to the, the thing we just said, which is if it's, if it's available, we'll usually be in Madlib. Um, there are some instances where um, that even working with certain types of data, it makes sense to maybe use a procedural language so that you can execute smaller modules inside or go through some process um, because I'm better at doing it in R or Python um, because I'm not such a SQL expert. So that, that would be the only additional reason. And also recall that we mentioned that Madlib is, is used to build one single model on your entire data set. And procedural languages essentially give you power when you have to build multiple models. So that makes the distinction on which one you would pick depending on your scenario. Got it. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. So uh, do all of these tools uh, only work with Greenplum and Pivotal products? Not really. So the tools, some of the tools that we presented, namely Pivotal R, PyMadlib, some of the, you know, the, the, the parts of speech tagger, the PL Python examples, all of these work with Postgres as well. Um, you know, Postgres, as you all know, is not MPP. It runs only on a single machine, but we strongly encourage you to download Greenplum's single node edition, which you can get from the links on one of the slides. And you can install this on a single node, but it'll still be able to take the benefit of multi-core processors so, you know, anything that you can do on Postgres, if you have an eight-core processor, you should probably be able to do the same thing eight times faster using, you know, the Greenplum single node edition. And that will give you a good way to try out all these tools before you think about longer-term plans for your organization. Excellent. Uh, so with that, I'm going to 
have to let that be the last uh, question and answer. I want to thank our audience for some great questions and uh, apologies for not being able to get to all of them. But rest assured, all the questions are going to be sent to the panelists and to Pivotal, and they will be getting back to you directly. And you have their contact information to reach out to them if you'd like as well. So I have just a few quick announcements to mark your calendars for April 15th in our next Data Science Central webinar, which will be sponsored by uh, Teradata. Also, as I mentioned, today's uh, event is being taped and will be made available later on this afternoon on datasciencecentral.com in the video section. Uh, this brings our webinar to a close. I'd like to thank our audience for their attendance and great questions, and a special thank you to Pivotal and the wonderful panelists for their insight into today's topic. My name is Tim Madison. I'm very pleased to have been your host for today's event, and I will look forward to seeing you all again on April 15th. Good day.